Hi guys, Mr. Rocco here. I hope you're having a good weekend. Um, we're going to continue with our Unit 5, Topic 5. Um, this video will be about the water cycle. So this is some information I'm just going to read to you here. Uh, it says, in the United States, there are 40 trillion, that's with a T, 40 trillion gallons of water above your head on an average day. Each day, about 4 trillion, so about one-tenth of that, a water falls to earth as precipitation, rain, snow, hail. Some of the water that falls to earth soaks into the ground and provides runoff to rivers, lakes, and oceans. The remainder, <clears throat> more than two and a half trillion gallons, returns to the atmosphere through evaporation and the process begins again. This continuous process of precipitation and evaporation is called the water cycle, or hydrologic cycle. Remember that one of the spheres of Earth is called the hydrosphere, hydra meaning water. Uh, the water cycle's been going on ever since oceans formed on Earth 3.8 billion years ago. Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago, which we remember from astronomy, but water was not present at the start. So you're talking, if you subtract these numbers, you're looking at 0.8 billion years which would be 800 million years so for the first 800 million years of earth there was no uh, water at some point possibly because of the heating of hydrogen and oxygen as earth developed water vapor began to form in the atmosphere oceans formed and the cycle began uh, there's even a theory that comets possibly brought some of the water to trigger the water cycle that uh, collisions with comets. Remember, a comet, the head of a comet is made of ice and rock material, so some of that water might have been delivered by comets as they smashed into Earth way back when. 70% uh, of the Earth is covered by water in the atmosphere, uh, rivers, oceans, and groundwater, and everywhere else on Earth. There's a total of 326 million cubic miles of water. That's more than 326 uh, million trillion gallons. Unfortunately, less than 1% of that water is in your rivers, lakes, and groundwater, which we use. Most of the water on Earth, 97% of it, is in the oceans, which of course, unfortunately, is salt water. Uh, the oceans distribute heat around the planet, keeping the heat and the cold circulating by way of ocean currents, which we looked at last week on some of those assignments. Now, can we make more fresh water? Uh, the first and most obvious way of getting clean water is to distill it. If you can afford one, then you could get a specialized distillation apparatus like they use in a laboratory in school. Um, Mr. Stevenson, who teaches chemistry, has a water distiller. Uh, another popular means of getting clean water is by freezing salt water or seawater. Icebergs are often quite pure water, and sailors have actually melted down these icebergs to drink. Uh, some countries, as ridiculous as this sounds, um, have even considered towing an iceberg from the polar regions back home so that they can melt it down to use as drinking water. I think Saudi Arabia was one of those countries that looked into that. They were going to tow an iceberg back to Saudi Arabia. Of course, there'd be nothing left when it gets there, or very little. Uh, the third method is called reverse osmosis. The salt water is forced through a membrane, and the salt is filtered out by this very fine membrane. Uh, this is used in dry countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's also used a lot in the United States. Uh, Florida, Texas, and California use reverse osmosis. And the U.S. Navy, the Navy ships use reverse osmosis. Uh, over here on the left is a water distiller. And over here on the right is a diagram to show reverse osmosis. So you have this membrane right in the middle, which is semi-permeable. Uh, permeability, which is something we'll talk about this week, is the ability of water to flow through the soil, or through, in this case, a membrane. If it's semi-permeable, that means some stuff can flow through, some can't. So what you see here is they fill the left side with salt water. And what happens is they put the salt water under pressure, and that forces the water through. So the water molecules are small enough to fit through this membrane, but the salt, which is a larger molecule, can't pass through. So the salt crystals are left over here on the, on the left side, and it pushes the fresh water through on the right side. And that's basically what reverse osmosis is. Um, this is an article I found a few years ago that talks about a 
a very uh, efficient uh, saltwater reverse osmosis plant over in England. Um, and this says by the year 2025, so you're talking five years from now, or sorry, four years from now, <laughs> the United Nations reports that two out of three people on Earth will live in places without enough fresh water to drink or grow crops. One way to beat the trend is to extract water from saltwater. The most common method is reverse osmosis, which is energy intensive. To reduce the, ener the energy burden, researchers are developing other methods to desalinate water, such as using biomimetic membranes. Some proposed desalination plants will reduce the energy needs by using energy capture schemes or sustainable energy power sources like wind power. Uh, here is how one state-of-the-art plant, it's called the Thames, or Thames Gateway Water Treatment Works, which opened, this was a couple of years ago, over in East London. It produces 39 million gallons of fresh water every day. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, it says most desalination plants take advantage of reverse osmosis to filter salt from the water. Pumps force the salt water through a sheet of polyamide wound around a giant cylinder. Water molecules squeeze between these individual polyamide chains to pass through to the membrane's far side. The dissolved salt can't pass between the polymer chains, so it stays behind. The Becton plant uses a unique four-stage process. Most plants do one or two stages. Running brackish water, brackish water is salt water, through four sets of membranes, each step of which generates more fresh water out of the salty Thames uh, River. In a two-step process, only 50% of the water becomes drinkable. The engineers at this Becton plant will convert 85% into fresh water. So there's a 35% increase, and it's because they're doing it four times instead of twice. Um, now, they don't waste anything. So you've converted 85% to fresh water. They still have 15% that didn't become fresh. So it says here, the 15% that remains now is, again, briny means it's still kind of salty, is still under pressure, and that pressure can be recaptured. That 15% brine spins a turbine in the plant's energy recovery device. This turbine runs a pump that boosts the pressure for the next batch of salt water, so they don't waste any of it. That 15% goes back into the system and, again, is used to, for energy for the next batch. Uh, these are just some statistics. So again, the U.S. Navy, when it's out, when let's say you have a Navy ship out to sea for months and months and months and months, right? There's no water or fresh water around. So they actually will do reverse osmosis on the Navy ship. And a typical Navy, uh, Navy aircraft carrier can produce 400,000 gallons of fresh water a day, which is enough for 1,000 homes every day. Uh, the biggest reverse osmosis uh, plant in the world is actually in Israel, and it can produce 73 million gallons of fresh water. Again, just to reference this, Becton one in London can do uh, 39 million, which is still impressive, but that's the biggest one. Uh, this is a picture of the Becton one in London. So these are all these cylinders where the water gets forced through the polymer chains and is uh, produces the fresh water. Um, how much does it cost? So regular municipal water. So I live in the village. Some of you might live in the village of Rhinebeck and you don't have a well. You get your water through uh, municipal water. It's piped in. That can cost about $1.50 for every thousand gallons. Um, to reverse osmosis, you're looking at twice the price, $3 for every thousand gallons. Um, so it is a little costly and I think that's where the problem comes in. Uh, how many desalination plants are there in the United States? There's about 250. Um, again, each one has a capacity to generate greater than 0.025 million gallons. So that's 250,000 right? gallons a day. Half of them are in Florida, and there's a few dozen plants in California and Texas. So again, go back to the beginning of Earth, 4.6 billion or around 4 billion. Earth was really just volcanic with lava spewing. And over time, Earth cooled, and we started the whole process eventually of the water cycle. So the definition of a water cycle is a model used to show the movement of water and its phase changes. So we start with different parts of the water cycle. So this is just a breakdown of the water cycle. And I have another YouTube video I will link on Canvas in the same assignment that I'd like you to watch. It's a short well, five, six minute video on the water cycle. So you should watch that video as well. 
Um, so down underneath the ground, if you dig through, you will eventually reach what's called impermeable bedrock. So if you dug a hole and you keep going down and down and down into the earth, eventually right here you hit solid bedrock. Impermeable means water can't penetrate through here. So as water is going to seep into the ground, it's going to eventually stop right here. It's like uh, filling a glass, right? The bottom of the glass is where the water can only go to, right? unless you had a hole in the glass. <laughs> it's going to start at that bottom of the glass and then fill back up. Well, that's the same idea here. So the bottom of the glass, in air quotes, is the impermeable bedrock. Um, water gets into the atmosphere. So that's like step one. And we've talked a little about this. So oceans and lakes, so you've got a lake, let's say, and you've got an ocean, they're going to evaporate. So evaporation is turning this uh, liquid water in the oceans, right? The sun is going to take uh, effect and going to heat up the water and cause it to turn into gas and evaporate. So lakes and oceans and rivers are going to evaporate. The process of transpiration is when water comes off the trees and the plants. And the way I always remember that <clears throat> is that T for transpiration and T for trees. That's supposed to be a tree. I know it's a sad looking tree, but that's a tree. So transpiration is coming off of trees. So what they do in earth science is they take the word evaporation and combine it with the word transpiration. And you get this big word evapotranspiration, which is evaporation and transpiration water coming from the oceans and the lakes and water that's transpiring coming off the trees and the plants so evaporation comes from the oceans transpiration comes from the trees and then they put the two words together to make a big word evapotranspiration now once that water's up in the atmosphere that's where the jet stream comes in the prevailing winds remember in the united states we're in the southwest winds everything goes from southwest toward the northeast and so the winds that's probably this would be evaporation would be step one <clears throat> step two would be the winds the winds are now going to carry that moisture over to the land step three you have to have the clouds so that's condensation which you already know from weather so condensation is going to create the clouds and then step four would be precipitation once those clouds are full and too heavy to hold on to any moisture there's precipitation whether it's rain or snow now once the water hits the ground so you had step one evapotranspiration two the winds carried the moisture to the land three was condensation step four was precipitation now the water can do several different things and it's going to depend on the ground infiltration is one thing that the water can possibly do infiltrate means that gravity will start to pull the water down if and this is a big if if the ground isn't already saturated so the ground can't already be full has to be some room for water the ground can't be frozen like this time of year it's very hard for water to infiltrate because the ground is still frozen in the winter if the land is relatively flat a gentle slope it's easier for water to have time to infiltrate um, if the land is steep like you see over here right gravity is going to have more of an effect than the uh, being able to seep into the ground so the water will not be able to go into the ground quickly it's going to run off quickly and that's what they call that runoff which we'll get to in a sec here it is so if the ground is steep like over here the ground can't doesn't have time to let it infiltrate and so it does exactly what that means it runs off and that means that's your rivers and your streams um, some of you might live on a steeper piece of property where you know every time it rains you have these little all of a sudden instant rivers and little streams that come down your driveway or down your property if you live on a steeper slope so you know exactly what runoff is if you live on a steeper uh, piece of property and then this is kind of now through in a whole bunch of other stuff so let's go through so we already covered evaporation we'll check that off we covered transpiration we covered the wind we covered condensation we covered precipitation we covered infiltration seeping into the ground we covered runoff if the water um, if the ground is uh, frozen or in the winter time which is still on the ground then you have another thing called storage so that's up here in the corner storage means the the water is in the frozen state so when you have snowpack on the ground which we still have although this week it's supposed to get into the 60s so we might lose a lot of that storage 
as that snow will rapidly melt this upcoming week. Um, but storage is just ice and snow that's still sitting on the ground. That's just, it's like in reserve, waiting to go into the ground or runoff, depending on the ground. Now, inside the ground are two different zones. There is from the ground, let's say this is a surface, and it's going to depend on your piece of property, but down so many feet, you have the first portion, the top portion of the ground as you're going into the earth is called the zone of aeration. Now it's spelled with an E, like you think of air that you breathe, right? That's A-I-R. Similar, except it's A-E-R. So the zone of aeration, because you hear that word air in there, is what that is. It does have air inside, meaning this part up here is not completely filled with water. There's some water up here. The soil is damp, but it's not completely saturated. And there's not enough water to um, provide for your house. So what has to happen? Let me clear this mess. Let's say, oops. Let me go back sorry all right actually i don't want to clear it let's say your house is right here i'll draw a stick figure house uh, some of you live outside of the village where you have a well so when they drill for a well they're drilling down deeper 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 into the ground they have to hit what's called the water table the water table is just this imaginary line that separates out the zone of aeration from what's called now below that the zone of saturation saturation means it's filled with 100 percent water this is what your well has to go through so they're going to drill down through the ground hit the water table they're not going to stop there the well driller is going to keep on going you know maybe another 20 30 40 50 feet who knows they'll go down deeper and deeper and make sure they go far enough into the zone of saturation because they want to make sure that as now people move into the house, right? Now, you, let's say it's a brand new house and you're now living in the house. You have enough groundwater and to pull up through the well. It's going to get pumped up to use for your house. That's your, that's your water you're using for showering and washing dishes and, and everything else. And so the water table is just this line that separates the two zones. So you have the zone of aeration and the zone of saturation. Now, when they drill a well, they can't just stop at the zone of aeration because if you do that, you'll start to pull up uh, dirt water. It'll be water filled with sand and silt and stuff like that. Um, the water table can move up and down. If, let's say, we go into a very rainy period, right, we get a lot of rain or a lot of snow, the water table will rise and it'll come closer to the surface which also is not a good thing. You don't want a water table that's like right up here against the surface because then that means you'll have a flooded basement. So some of you might live on a piece of land or your property where every time it rains, you get a flooded basement. That's not a good thing either. But you also don't want to live where the water table is way down here, too low, because that means you're going to have to drill really, 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 really far, which is also very expensive. The the deeper they have to drill through the property to get to water, the more money it's going to cost you for the drilling. And you also have to worry that, let's say in a drought situation, what's actually going to happen, let's say this is the water table right here, right? In a drought, let's say we go into several months of dry period, this water table will drop. It might be here right now, but let's say six months from now, the water table will drop down to here. Well, that's a problem because now let's say your well only went to here, right? you're going to start and you'll know and some of you might have had this happen uh, where you start turning on the faucet in your house especially you guys that have wells and you start getting brown water uh, water with sand in it silt some kind of sediment in the water some kind of uh, dirt in the water uh, that's mean that means your well is starting to run uh, dry which is right away uh, very important that you have it um, re-drilled so they would do one of two things, and some of you might know this already, or if you ask your parents if this has happened, they might have to, the, probably the cheapest way is to take this well, and they'll just go into the same hole and drill down deeper, and hopefully get back down into the zone of saturation, if they can do that. Sometimes that doesn't always work, and then they'll drill down and they can't hit enough water. Now, instead of using the same hole that they originally used and tried to go deeper, they'll have to start maybe a new hole. So they might start over on another part of your property and start from scratch, which again is even going to cost you more money because now you're starting a brand new fresh well. 
Uh, so I'm sure some of you have had this issue. Usually I bring this up every year and I have a handful of students that have had issues with their well, which can be a big problem, right? No water, you know, that's a problem. Um, so when one inch of rain, let's say you own an acre, well, some of you might have more, way more than that, but if you had an acre of land and we got an inch of rainfall, let's say overnight, that's not that much rain, but in terms of gallons for every acre, that's over 27,000 gallons of water that fell on your property. So again, do the math. If you own 10 acres of land, right, it'd be 270,000, keep multiplying that factor. Or if you got two inches of rain instead of one, that's, you know, 54,000 gallons. So, you know, the numbers can really add up. That'll tell you how important rain is. So the water that you use, again, if you don't live in the village, I live in the village, and some of you might also, where you have what's called municipal water. It's pumped in, I have a meter, and the meter goes every time we turn on a faucet or, you know, uh, one of us takes a shower or you flush a toilet, anytime you use water. If you live outside the village, you have a well, so you're getting your water from the groundwater, which is all the water, again, below that water table. Uh, even if it's drought, that's still where you're pulling your water from, in that zone of saturation. Uh, so this shows the same thing here. So you might have a house, again, right here, let's say, and put a door and a chimney. Okay. Anyway, there's the well. The water table will always take a dip where your well is. And a lot of factors you have to look at, how many people are going to be in the house. So contractors will, if let's say it's a new home construction, they're going to ask those kinds of questions. You know, uh, is it a fa is it just like, say, a mother, father, and two kids? That's a you know typical home. Or is it a mother, father, and six kids, right? If you have a big, big family, that's going to use more water. So they're going to have to drill even deeper. So those are questions contractors will ask before they start drilling for water to see how many people are actually going to be living in the house. Um, water tables, again, will dip usually, especially in droughts or the more you use more water. Um, you can see the water table will be the surface of a stream. So as you go this way, you see now you're coming out from under the ground and you hit a stream or a river that might be near your house. That is the water table, so the surface of the stream. And then it goes back underground again. Uh, this is actually what a well would look like. So this is a picture actually. Um, before I moved to Rhinebeck, I used to live again. I mentioned that in class uh, up in Columbia County. I lived up in Hillsdale, which is up by Catamount. If you're a big skier or snowboarder, so you know where Catamount is. That's where I used to live uh, years ago. And my wife and I put in a new home construction. And this is a picture of actually the well as they uh, when they drilled it and they cap it. You can see it's bolted, so you don't want anything going into that well. So it's a big metal casing. The, um, that's put into the ground after they drill the hole uh, there'll be a pipe that runs down through this casing you don't see it uh, there's a pump way down at the bottom of the well they have to run electric so they'll run a line from here back to the house the, the electric is obviously used to run the pump and then this is capped uh, and then people will sometimes ca uh, cover these. Uh, my wife and I, I think I forget we did oh we put a fake rock over top of it so we had this plastic fake looking boulder that sat on top of this thing so people didn't see this ugly pipe sticking out of the ground uh, some people cover it with something decorative or put plants around it just so you don't see this ugly pipe sticking out of the ground um, the high school does have a well i believe um it's around the back of the property if i remember correctly um somewhere over i think by the softball field but don't quote me on that but i know there's a well back there somewhere in the back of the school property um, so this again shows the two zones. So this deeper, like darker purple would be the saturated zone or the, zone, the where the water you're pulling your groundwater. This kind of lightish pinkish color would be the unsaturated or the zone of, of aeration it's called zone of aeration. And then again, the water table just separates the two zones. So aerations up here, saturations down here. Uh, this shows again the same thing. So you can see the zone of aeration, some of the pore spaces, some of the openings between the rock particles are filled, but it's not 100%. But again, once you hit the water table, it's 100%. So this is 100% water down here in the zone of saturation. Um, this video right here, I'll put a link to it. It's uh, actually, 
It's an older video from like the 1980s. I have shown it in class from time to time. So it's interesting. It goes over the process that they do when they drill for a well. So I'll link this uh, video to YouTube clip on Canvas as well. So if you want to watch that and see how they actually go through the process of drilling um, for wells. Um, these were funny. I put these in here. <laughs> uh, these are aerators. So they actually do this on the school property. You'll notice sometimes I've had students go out on the ball fields and they'll see little tiny holes in the ground. And they always ask me, Mr. Rocco, what are they doing there? Those are aeration. So they go around. They don't use the boots, although those are kind of funny. They will go around and have this toe behind. They'll hook it to a tractor. And these little spikes on here are poking little holes in the ground. That's called aerating the lawn, which is always a good thing to do. I recommend that. If you have a lawn, you know, you say, oh, the grass never grows in really well. You know, it's not green. It's not lush. You can aerate your lawn. So, I mean, if you have a big, big piece of property, you might use a toe behind. Um, if you have a smaller piece of property that you can walk, you can use this thing over here, which you push. And they all do the same thing. They poke little holes in the lawn. That adds oxygen, which is what you want. You want to get the air into the grass, and you want to aerate the lawn there. Um, this is if you have a small piece of property like I do. I live in the village, so I don't have a large property. I, ha I don't own these, but I've thought about buying them. <laughs> uh, these are aerating. Uh, stra they strap onto your boots, and uh, they have little spikes on the bottom, and you would just walk all around your property poking little holes to aerate your lawn to uh, get it to grow. Once you get all that air, uh, that's going to help the lawn grow a little better, a little thicker, a little greener. So... I found this on Amazon. I forget what they cost. I have to go back and look. Uh, but they're kind of cool. Just be careful you don't hurt anybody with them because they're really sharp metal spikes. All right. And finally, the four things that can happen. So, again, once the precipitation happens, right, you have rain and the rain hits the ground, it can do one of these things, as we mentioned earlier. It can infiltrate, which means it seeps into the ground. Gravity's going to pull it in. Uh, it can go back up, evapotranspiration, so the water will come off the lakes, rivers, off the plants, transpire from the trees. It can run off. It goes into your rivers and streams, which eventually leads back to the oceans. Or, as we still have some on the ground, snowpack, it can be stored as ice and snow. So you have infiltration, evapotranspiration, uh, runoff, and storage. And I think that's it. Not a long video, so that's good. I will put this on Canvas. Again, please watch the entire video before you start completing assignments. Go back, rewind. That's the beauty of videos. You can, If something doesn't make sense, you can go back and listen to it again until hopefully it, it does make sense. And again, I'm going to post those couple of videos that go with this. One is a short one on the water cycle, and the other one's on how they drill for wells, if you're interested in watching those. And um, I will... Talk to you soon.